Yes, you may proceed, sir. This isn't an evidentiary hearing in which Your Honor sits as a fact finder after the presentation of evidence, documentary testimony, and weighs that evidence. This is a motion for summary judgment in which the court's sole function is to proceed to determine whether there is genuine issues of material fact which preclude the entry of summary judgment. And in doing so, it is essential to remember that all facts and inferences are drawn in favor of the non-moving parties, who in this case are medical specialists and Franciscan Alliance. In other words, factual assertions which are disputed preclude the entry of summary judgment. And summary judgment is further precluded unless the law is clear, even if there are undisputed factual issues. Inferences, too, which emerge from undisputed evidence, which can be conflicting, precludes the entry of summary judgment. Now, the Supreme Court has most recently spoken about non-competition agreements in the context of medical care. In the Central Indiana Podiatry v. Kruger case at 882 Northeastern 2nd, 723, 725, when it tells us that we hold that non-competition agreements between a physician and a medical practice group are not per se void as against public policy and are enforceable to the extent they are reasonable. To be geographically reasonable, the agreement may restrict only that area in which the physician-developed patient relationships using the practice group's resources. Now, note, please, what the emphasis is. It is the physician who is leaving and seeking to violate or avoid the covenant not to compete who is enjoined from practicing within the geographical restriction because he has used the group's resources in order to build his practice. And as we all agree, as Dr. Stemmer sets out in his affidavit and we set out in our response, and the plaintiffs agree in their reply, they came here to Northwest Indiana with no patients, no practice, and no physician resources. They were recruited to come here and provide care, and they got the advantage of being able to practice in a stable group that was linked together as a result of the existence of employment agreements that contain within them covenants not to compete. And so the question becomes in this as in every case, is the covenant reasonable with regard to the necessity of the breadth for the protection of the covenantee? And as the Supreme Court tells us, the covenantee here would be medical specialists. And what we're looking at is where the physician who is seeking to leave and violate the covenant is going as practice because he has done so with the resources of the employer. Whether there is a restriction which is reasonable upon the covenantor and the public interest. Now, one of the major cases, as we will hear throughout the course of the argument, is medical specialists versus Sluian, which is at 652 Northeastern 2nd, 517. It involves the same basic agreement, and it involves the same basic arguments. And as the Court of Appeals said in 
reversing the denial of a preliminary injunction that medical specialists sought and putting it in place to keep Dr. Sluian from practicing in violation of his covenant not to compete. Quote, the question of reasonableness is for the court and it is to be determined by looking at all the facts and circumstances surrounding each case. But in a summary judgment proceeding such as we are in, quote, all facts and reasonable inferences drawn from these facts are construed in favor of the non-moving party, that's us. And the goodwill that is developed by a medical practice, as the Supreme Court tells us in the Raimundo case, is consistently upheld as a legitimately protectable interest. The goodwill we're told in Norland will be protected with a covenant not to compete. And that's the broad category of assets, including the business's location, its name, its recognition, its patients, its referrals, and its position in the community. All of those things are enforceable with a covenant not to compete. Now, the first thing we're told is that we don't have a protectable interest. But as we're told in the Sluian case, the continued success of medical specialists, which remains, Your Honor, as an ongoing business entity, is an interest worthy of production. The covenant's prohibition against Dr. Sluian practicing within a 10-mile radius of each hospital served by specialists, exactly what our covenant is, to be served by specialists, to be a reasonable effort to protect the continued success of medical specialists, a legitimate interest worthy of protection. Now, Dr. Sluian was the appellee when the case went to the Indiana Court of Appeals. And medical specialists appealed the wrongful denial of its motion for preliminary injunction. The Court of Appeals reversed and said, trial court, you should have sustained the motion for preliminary injunction because medical specialists had a protectable interest. And you, Dr. Sluian, in attempting to practice in violation of the covenants contained within your contract, the covenants that are basically the same here, you violated those. Dr. Sluian lost and he said, you know, my lawyers were no good. So he sued his lawyers. And his lawyers got summary judgment. And it went up to the Court of Appeals. And the Court of Appeals said, your case was no good, Dr. Sluian. And so the fact that your lawyers were no good doesn't establish causation sufficient to establish a breach of the duty of care which caused you any damages. Because you could not prevail against medical specialists because their covenant was reasonable and they had a protectable interest in their continued success after having nurtured you in the practice of medicine. Now, who tells us that medical specialists is still in operation? Here is the plaintiff's brief. Quote, this leaves the four physicians in this case and a few others as the only physicians performing medical services for medical specialists. So despite the fact that they've told you that medical specialists ceased to exist at the time of the asset purchase agreement, as Dr. Stemmer has told you in his affidavit, that's not true. It continues to be an ongoing business entity. And the plaintiffs themselves tell you that in their brief. In fact, they maintain that they are physicians performing medical services for medical specialists. And there are other physicians performing medical services for medical specialists. Now, if that doesn't create a material issue of fact, I don't know what does. Because they tell us here that medical specialists was out of business. They tell us in their brief that medical specialists continued on. And Dr. Stemmer tells you in his affirmation that medical specialists continues as a functioning business. 
That is central to their argument that there is no protectable interest. As Dr. Stemmer says in his affirmation paragraph 7, medical specialists through its employed physicians provide important hospital services in Northwest Indiana by virtue of having entered into medical director agreements with local institutions such as St. Catherine's Hospital in Chicago, Community Hospital Munster, and St. Mary Medical Center Holbrook. The designation of medical specialists employed physicians as a hospital or extended care facility director has served as an imprimatur from the Hospital of the Physician's Skills Collective Expertise of Medical Specialists, which in turn have assisted medical specialist physicians in building their practices. Now, the medical specialist medical director agreements have not been assigned to Franciscan Alliance. And in paragraph 18 of his affirmation, Dr. Stemmer tells you why. The services contemplated by the medical director agreements with community foundation hospitals are best rendered by physicians who are not employed by Franciscan Alliance when they are rendering those services. And then he tells you further on down at the bottom of the page, I, Dr. Stemmer, have assured the executives at hospitals within the community hospital system that medical specialists will continue to provide physicians to fulfill the duties and responsibilities imposed by these medical director agreements as well as clinical care to the patients at each of these hospitals. And as he tells you in his affirmation further, medical specialist has already hired Dr. Chi as a physician to come to work for it. And Dr. Chi has been employed as an infectious disease physician, and Dr. Chi will be providing care at, among others, St. Catherine Hospital in East Chicago. That is in paragraph 26 of his affirmation. Now, why is it important to understand how the medical director agreements work? Well, medical director agreements with the community hospital firmament, which includes community hospital in Munster, St. Catherine Hospital in East Chicago, and St. Mary Mercy Hospital in Holbrook, have entered into agreements with medical specialists in order for a specific physician to provide particular guidance, instruction, and administration with regard to pulmonary care, infection control, wound care, and the like. And because we want to make sure that the physicians that are providing that care at the time they're providing it, or providing those services at the time they're providing it, are not their competitor's employees, Franciscan Alliance employees, those are going to be carried out by medical specialists' employees. And that's what Dr. Stemmer is telling you in his affirmation. In other words, medical specialists was in existence at the time of the asset purchase agreement, was in existence thereafter, in part because these physicians continue to work for it, is hiring physicians currently, and has these medical director agreements with the community hospital firmament, which are best served, as Dr. Stemmer points out, when the care is being rendered, the services are being provided by physicians who are not Franciscan Alliance employee physicians. That then creates the protectable interest that allows for the enforcement of the covenants not to compete. The agreement which the parties have entered into, that is Franciscan Alliance and medical specialists, is certainly not a sham, but in order for you to reach that conclusion, you have to evidence what? You have to decide that the two entities, a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar Catholic entity and medical specialists, have entered into an agreement to dupe the court, and that they have no intention of carrying out any of the terms or provisions of this agreement. That's evidence point. 
You can't weigh the evidence, Your Honor, as you well know, at this stage of the proceedings. That's something to be determined in an evidentiary hearing, not in a motion for summary judgment. But look at the basis for the agreement, which is A1 to our response. Among the things that are provided for is a limited waiver of the restrictive covenants. And what happened with regard to that is Franciscan Alliance says, we understand, medical specialists, why it is important that you provide services and care at community hospital institutions, and you do so with individuals who are not employed by Franciscan Alliance at that time. So here's what the agreement provides. Among other things, it allows medical specialists to engage up to five physicians to care for patients previously cared for by the departing physicians. In other words, the plaintiffs in this case leave the practice at the end of this month. And so Franciscan Alliance has said to medical specialists, you may employ up to five physicians to make sure that the patients that they're seeing can be transitioned to others. And you are specifically empowered to provide those services to patients formerly treated by the departing physicians and to any new patients treated by the replacement physician in the normal course of his or her practice. And in order to do that, Franciscan Alliance says to medical specialists, we give you the right to use the goodwill, we give you the right to use the medical records, and we give you the right to enter into patient agreements. Moreover, you get to use office space with regard to those physicians. There will be medical specialists employed physicians to carry out these duties and responsibilities. And why not earlier? Well, because it's June 30th that the plaintiffs are leaving. And so what we're doing is anticipating their departure and giving medical specialists the right to put physicians in place to make up for their departure. Medical specialists have the obligation under that agreement to provide professional liability insurance, and it has the obligation to maintain its own bank accounts and to pay the physicians accordingly. Now, this is hardly an agreement which is a sham. It is, in fact, directed towards a real problem which arises on June 30th. It doesn't need to take place any earlier, but it does have to be in place so that on June 30th, when these physicians who have given us notice of their departure leave, we have the rights as medical specialists to make sure that we can continue to see the patients. Now, the protectable interest that we're talking about here has continued on, and there is nothing at all that is illusory about these agreements. While the fact that Franciscan Alliance can terminate the agreements given 90 days' notice, as everybody knows, agreements terminal at the will of one party are still enforceable contracts, and that's Monon Railroad Corporation v. New York Central, 227 Northeastern 2nd, 450, 456. Now, there's more than sufficient consideration to support these agreements. That is that the Franciscan Alliance is giving up a valuable right, the covenant not to compete, and is engaging in a limited waiver of that covenant not to compete, so medical specialists will now have physicians who will be permitted to render this care without regard to the covenant not to compete, which is the subject of the asset sale agreement. And that's all you need for consideration, a benefit to one party or a detriment to the other. That's sufficient consideration in the state of Indiana to withhold this. And, of course, medical specialists have certain obligations as well, including the fact that they have to provide the liability insurance, they have to enter into the agreements, recruit and enter into the agreements with these new physicians, who they've already started to enter into. Now, remember that the public interest 
um, and the protection of goodwill is a very important consideration in the state of Indiana. And the important consideration is the freedom of contract. When determining whether or not a contract is against public policy, we must keep in mind that it is to the best interest of the public that persons should not be unnecessarily restricted in their freedom of contract. Because covenants not to compete which restrict the provision of medical services in a prescribed area are not per se against public policy, we must consider the fact that Dr. Stemmer has a right to enter into a contract which reasonably protects medical specialists with will. So Dr. Stemmer has the right to enter into the contract with the Franciscans, and Dr. Stemmer has the right to enter into the contract with the new physicians on behalf of medical specialists to continue to protect the goodwill of medical specialists, and Dr. Stemmer had the right to enter into the contracts with each of the plaintiffs, and the Court of Appeals specifically tells us that he has and he has always had that right. Now, they tell us that the reason that the contracts are unenforceable, even if there is a protectable interest that medical specialists has, and there clearly is a material issue of fact about whether or not medical specialists is an ongoing entity with a protectable interest that it seeks uh, to vindicate, is that the um, area is undersupplied with physicians in the plaintiff's specialties. That's what they, that's what they contend. Now, this is no different than the argument that was made and rejected 20 years ago by Dr. Sluian at the Court of Appeals, twice. Once, when medical specialists appealed the wrongful denial of the preliminary injunction, it was reversed. And the second time, when Dr. Sluian said his suit his own lawyers, because he maintained that the reason he lost was their fault and not because of the fact that he advanced arguments that were not uh, justified. And here we have the, the evidence that Dr. Sluian presented many years ago. At trial, Ricardo Hood, the health commissioner of the city of Gary, testified that Gary had been designated by the Department of Health and Human Services as a medically underserved area. I heard that repeatedly by counsel earlier today. That was the bellwether argument earlier, and that was the bellwether argument in the early 1990s. And that indicates a shortage of doctors. He conceded that he did not know if Gary had been determined to be underserved in the area of infectious disease. And then further, uh, Dr. George Burrell, who was the chief operating officer of what that time was called North Northwest Family, that was the old Gary St. Mary's, echoed this concern. Burrell based his opinion on the fact that Gary hospitals provide medical services to large numbers of Medicaid, Medicare, and indigent care recipients who need more infectious disease services than would the average community because of these patients' lack of preventative care. Exactly the argument that counsel is making today. And then the evidence that was proffered by medical specialists, Dr. Theodore Eichhoff, an infectious disease doctor and professor of medicine at the University of Colorado testified that on average there are only 0.75 to 0.8 full-time equivalent infectious disease doctors for 100,000 citizens in the United States. Thus, Dr. Eichhoff opined that the infectious disease services offered to the approximately 116,000 people of Gary by doctors Jal, Simon, and Ando substantially exceeded the national average and that those services are more than adequate to meet the needs of dairy citizens. And so the, the court concludes, and this is, this is now evidence one, because this is up on a preliminary injunction. The evidence fails to reveal a shortage of infectious disease doctors in dairy, which would justify the need for Dr. Sluian services. Rather, the undisputed evidence indicates that the services of Dr. Zhao, Simon, and Ando are more than adequate to meet Gary's infectious disease services. Now let's look at now what's happened, primarily because of the activities of medical specialists, to Dr. Stemmer, in the ensuing 20 years. 
We're no longer dealing with those three doctors from 20 years ago. We are now dealing with 21 infectious disease physicians in Lake County. And in terms of that number, in Lake County, the ratio is one infectious disease physician for every 23,000, whereas the national average is one for every 36,382. Now, if you look at the next chart and you compare it to the national average, you will see that Northwest Indiana is better served with infectious disease specialists than is the country as a whole. And East Chicago, about which there has been much um, concern expressed, is better served yet again. Indeed, there are 18 infectious disease physicians who are available in East Chicago. Now, let's go to plaintiff's experts, Jamie Ruiz Montero. He admitted that he has access to multiple infectious disease physicians for referrals, and quote, there are tons of infectious disease physicians who have privileges at St. Catherine Hospital. This is the plaintiff's witness. And this is, these are his admissions in his deposition. Now, with regard to the pulmonologists, that's the other primary group that we're talking about here, there are 23 pulmonologists in Lake County. And I, I hasten to point out that these numbers do not include the plaintiffs. And Northwest Indiana is significantly better served than the United States. Um, the, with the 23, that is one for every uh, 21,700 in Lake County compared to one for every 21,000 in the United States. So it's basically the same, but in Munster, the relationship between the number of patients and the number of pulmonary care physicians is much improved. So it is substantially better than, than the national average. And as you can see from the affidavit from Dr. Stemmer, a patient who wants to see a specialist in pulmonary diseases can receive an appointment within one day of requesting an appointment at the Franciscan Medical Specialist Munster office and the same day as uh, requesting an appointment at a uh, FMS office. Now the plaintiffs looked to Dr. Len Cavell and he was an offer because of issues with regard to allergies. And he testified that he never investigated whether there were some other allergists, because Dr. Patel, one of the plaintiffs, is an allergist, available to see his patients. He doesn't know if there are other allergists to whom he can currently refer, but he could refer patients to other local allergists, including Dr. Rademacher, Blumenthal, and Kanza. And the same was with regard to Dr. Um, Brenda Thompson, who also made the same allegation with regard to the loss of um, uh, lack of allergy. This has been the argument that has been used as far as I know at least as far back as the Raimundo case. And Dr. Raimundo maintained that when he left the Hammond Clinic in violation of his covenant not to compete, and that was a 25 mile covenant, uh, he could do so because there was a public policy argument that if he was out of the practice for that 25 mile radius, that would undermine patient care. The Supreme Court in 1983 rejected that argument. And, and as, the, as the underscored area of the slide in front of you says, his comments, Dr. Raimundo's, that it is the public interest for physicians as a group to determine their code of conduct and ethical standards that enforcement of such covenants may inflict a hardship upon the covenant for, and that the public may thereby be denied medical services are unpersuasive in light of the public interest in the freedom of individuals to contract. In other words, Your Honor, in 1983, the Supreme Court said, we understand your argument. 
that there's a public interest argument because you're a physician and you're telling us now that after you got the benefit of the contract, you now maintain that your patients might not be adequately served if the, con if the covenant is, is enforced. The court rejected it because they said the freedom of contract is more important. Then we have the Sluian argument in 1995, where he marshals all of this evidence to say that the area is medically underserved, that there are too many Medicare and Medicaid patients, and if I'm out of the practice, Dr. Sluian, then there won't be adequate physicians to take care of them. With far fewer infectious disease physicians at that time, the Court of Appeals specifically rejected it, not once, but twice. Once when there was a direct appeal from the wrongful denial of the preliminary injunction, and the second time when he sued his lawyers because he claimed they, he, that they botched his case. Simply stated, the law doesn't allow somebody to come into court and say, it's medically underserved, relieve me from my covenant. There are too many Medicare patients, relieve me from my covenant. There are too many Medicaid patients, relieve me from my covenant. There are too many poor people, relieve me from my covenant. There are too many HIV AIDS patients, relieve me from my covenant. The Court of Appeals has made it abundantly clear, and the Supreme Court has instructed them, you can't do it. Now, um, the contract issue about the material breach. While at the outset, much of what we heard at the beginning of the case had to do with Catholic directives, uh, counsel has told us today that that doesn't serve as an impediment at all. And um, the, all of the plaintiffs have acknowledged that they practice medicine um, at the same location, receiving a paycheck for medical specialists, using the offices, using the records, with no change in their practice, and they have not been subject to, nor have they been quite required to comply with the Catholic directives. It hasn't happened. There's several reasons for it, not the least of which is they're non-Franciscan Alliance providers, but they haven't been forced to do anything, and counsel wisely concluded that that wasn't a material breach. Now, whether a material party is a material breach of contract is a question of fact. But we're not at the fact stage. The Court of Appeals has told us this repeatedly. Whether a breach of is material is itself a question of fact to be decided by the trier of fact. Now, at some point, Your Honor, you might be the trier of fact. But today, Your Honor, you are not. And so as a result, you cannot decide whether or not there has been a material breach because of the asset purchase agreement. But what does seem clear from Dr. Stever's affidavit is that these individuals come to work, get paid, do their, perform their services, see their patients exactly as they did before October 1st, 2012. Now, there's another reason why this material breach argument isn't a very good one. And it comes from the 2008 Indiana Supreme Court case. In that particular case, the Kruger case, the, the employee who violated the covenant said, you know, the employer did a lot of things that he shouldn't have done. And that constitutes a breach. And because there was a breach, the employer can't enforce the covenant against them. And the Supreme Court observed, because there is a no defense um, uh, policy uh, provision in our covenant not to compete, to the extent we find any authority on no defense provisions, the provisions have been upheld, even in the face of apparently major breaches by the employer. Now our covenant specifically provides 
that it survives the termination of the employment agreement, regardless of the reason that the agreement was terminated. That's a no defense provision. And the Supreme Court tells us in Kruger that a no defense provision is likely to find favor in Indiana because they are upheld elsewhere, even in the face of apparently major breaches. Now, I emphasize to the court, you don't have to reach that conclusion because this isn't an evidentiary hearing. You don't evidence way to find out whether there's been a material breach, but there's a major issue with regard to whether or not, even if there is, it's even the law. Because the law seems to be, what Kruger suggests, is that a material breach in the face of a no defense provision precludes somebody from avoiding their covenant not to compete. Now, finally, yesterday, we got this verified motion for permission to file a second supplemental designation of evidence. It's been commented on, and naturally, I'd like to be able to make a formal written response to it. But the gist of it is that on January 25th, 2013, there was a letter written that was signed by Dr. Stemmer that had to do with a Dr. Yassar's request for a J1 designation in order to practice internal medicine and infectious disease in our county. At the time that letter was written, there was significant concern on Dr. Stemmer's part because there was a possibility of losing six local infectious disease physicians. Dr. Aboija, Dr. Hadadeen, Dr. Jowett, Dr. Kapoor, and Dr. Atassi, who was one of the plaintiffs here, who had given notice that he was terminating his agreement. Dr. Sarma was also on leave due to illness. Despite Dr. Stemmer's concern, the J1 waiver request was denied. And in the ensuing seven months, we've now been able to fill all of those vacancies. Dr. Andow, who was working both in Illinois and Indiana, has now come and worked solely in Indiana. Dr. Chung has replaced Dr. Hadadeen. Dr. Sarma is back at work. Dr. Querzeda has been hired, and that's set out in Dr. Stemmer's affidavit. And Dr. Chi has been hired. So the concern that the area might be five infectious disease physicians low, which was a concern in January, has now been rectified by the end of June. So the issue, if it existed then, no longer exists now. And as you can see from the listing of the infectious disease physicians, and you can see from the listing of the pulmonary care physicians, we have more than adequate numbers to provide care for a greater ratio of patients than we did then compared to the national average. It's important to emphasize that you will never have a covenant not to compete that will be enforced if it can be defeated by an argument based upon Medicare, Medicaid, or disease in general. You and I both know that the population is aging. You and I both know that there are lots of poor people. You and I both know that there are lots of sick people, particularly as the population ages. But the courts have made it clear that the freedom of contract is the preeminent virtue. They made it clear in 1983 with Dr. Raimundo. They made it clear again in 1995 with Dr. Sluian. 
and they made it again clear with regard to Kruger. The freedom of contract is the primary issue that we have here. And we cannot have someone take the advantages and then, and the goodwill, and then appropriate it to their own use. So with regard to the protectable interest, there is a material issue of fact with regard to whether or not medical specialists has a protectable interest not, not only in October, now, and in the future. That precludes summary judgment based upon that theory to justify being able to void the employment contract. With regard to the public interest, there is a genuine issue of material fact with regard to whether or not we have adequate coverage without these defendants, without these plaintiffs, with regard to allergy, with regard to pulmonary care, and with regard to infectious disease. And as a matter of law, the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals have rejected allegations that the public interest will defeat the freedom of contract in exactly this situation. And with regard to whether or not we are in material breach, there is a significant dispute under the facts and circumstances of this case as to whether any breach occurred. Remember, there is nothing in the contract that these people signed that precludes medical specialists from assigning its contract. Nothing. The only one who can't assign these personal service contracts are the plaintiffs. Now, they might have had expectations or goals about what their future was going to be, but the simple fact of the matter is there is nothing in the four corners of this agreement that somehow or another protects medical specialists, prohibits them from doing exactly what they did, or gives the plaintiffs increased rights with regard to it. But materiality is a factual question which can't be resolved now. And equally significant is the issue of whether or not a no defense provision in a contract like this allows for enforcement of an otherwise enforceable covenant not to compete, even though there is an issue with regard to the circumstances surrounding one of these individuals' termination. The most recent case from the Supreme Court seems to indicate that it is not a defense and the no defense provision provides that these things are still enforceable regardless of the circumstances surrounding the termination. So for all those reasons, Your Honor, the summary judgment motion should be denied and this matter should be set over for a trial, which is clearly not today, and this is not an evidence claim. Thank you. Thank you. Just a hopefully brief response. Mr. Jensen's arguments that we've started with discussing some older cases that actually involve medical specialists and some doctors, like Dr. Lungo, who used to be my neighbor, believe it or not, when I was a kid, and Dr. Slubion. The decisions the courts render about whether those non-competes were applicable or not, or enforceable or not, had nothing to do with the circumstances that are ongoing in this case. There was no asset sale. The medical specialist didn't sell itself for $23 million and leave these people in an empty shell. They were going enterprise, going concern. That's a case of two individual doctors wanting out because I don't think you should be able to enforce these because I'm in a medical industry. It's not the only argument we have. Not even close. If medical specialists didn't change the form, still a going concern, still had, still was a middle size, like we talked about, independent specialty health care provider, those cases would control. They don't control this situation. Mr. Jensen spoke about whether fact-finding, not whether fact-finding, he says that because fact-finding is necessary to determine whether they have a protectable interest, the court can issue some rejection. We disagree, and have so stated in our reply brief, and we've cited the Indiana cases that support that position. In this case, there is no dispute about the interactions or behavior of the party. So the issue of materiality becomes a question of contract interpretation. 
which is a question of law for the court. Williams v. Tharp, 914 Northeast 2nd, 756, Supreme Court, 2009. So let's talk about what is, what are, what is the behavior of the parties that we're discussing. Mr. Jensen says, we had to enter into this contract when we did between medical specialists and Franciscan because these doctors have to go June 30th. They've resigned in their leave. I don't know, because the court sits in equity, if the court is going to be able to determine that entering into that agreement two days before your response is due to a summary judgment is going to be considered a valid argument. I hope not. And the fact, the agreement in its own four corners, if your honor wants to look at it, is it a sham, is it a ruse? It's cancelable by Franciscan, for lack of a better way to put it, the 800-pound gorilla in the room. A 90 days notice, with or without cause, for any reason or no reason at all. That's not an agreement. Not when anyone would enter into it unless they were trying to get a lawsuit. I don't even have to say that's why. The agreement itself, that Exhibit A3, for the defendant's designation, acknowledges this lawsuit. It says exactly why they're entering into the contract. It doesn't say, well, these guys are leaving and we've got to make some moves to replace them. Franciscan can do that. Franciscan, not medical specialists. Franciscan's done it. In our designation, at Exhibit D2, it's a letter, a medical specialist letterhead, to a patient. Dear Judith, I think the identifying information of what Judith is, and perhaps I think this is a remove for HIPAA purposes, and that's why. Dear Judith, your infectious disease physician, Dr. Keenan Natasi, has decided to leave medical specialists. I am pleased to inform you that we have an experienced infectious disease physician, Dr. Henry Ando, who is available to immediately assume your medical care. Dr. Henry Ando is an employee of Franciscan Medical Specialists, not medical specialists. They've already got letters going out to Dr. Natasi's patients that they haven't covered, with non-medical specialists in place. Same thing to a Dear Brian, Exhibit D1. Dr. Keenan Natasi has decided to leave medical specialists. Pleased to inform you that we have an experienced infectious disease physician, Dr. Amjad Ali, another infectious disease doctor, but by Franciscan, not medical specialists. And there, in the list of designers under Exhibit C, is a Dear Jeffrey. Your pulmonary medicine physician, Dr. Preneet Sethi, has decided to leave medical specialists. I'm pleased to inform you that we have an experienced pulmonary and sleep medicine specialist, Dr. Jatan Desai, who is available to assume your medical care. It's, again, a Franciscan employee, not a medical specialist. I'm not going to belabor the court with that, because they're in our submission. But to tell this court that they had to go out and hire these physicians to cover, and get this deal with Franciscan to cover, these doctors leaving, is a falsehood. They've already done that. They're physicians employed by medical specialists. This agreement that they've entered into is designed for one purpose only, to defeat this lawsuit. The moment this lawsuit is over, that will be the end of that agreement. In addition, Your Honor, the United Courts have said, in regard to whether you need to be a fact finder or determine issues of fact in determining whether there's contractual interest or a breach, a fact is material if its resolution would affect the outcome of the case. An issue is genuine if a trier of fact is required to resolve the parties differing accounts of the truth, or if the undisputed facts support conflicting reasonable inferences. Construction of the terms of a written contract is a pure question of law for the court. I don't think the behavior here, because you do something, and you come up with a great artifice that makes it look like something's correct, I don't think because I created a fact out of thin air, means there's a genuine issue of material fact. On October 1, 2012, that issue of material fact did not exist. It was created two days before this motion of their memorandum in response to our summary judgment was due, and only for the purpose of this lawsuit. I don't think the court needs to be a finder of fact to determine whether an issue is genuine and material. 
addition, Your Honor, Mr. Jensen spoke about the, that the freedom of contract outweighs the public policy and the patient concerns that have been expressed in some of these former lawsuits that involve a different fact pattern. We exercised, the plaintiffs exercised their freedom of contract when they entered into their employment agreements with medical specialists. Medical specialists voluntarily disappeared for $23 million. We didn't ask them to leave. We didn't support the sale. We didn't want it to go. And we didn't want to work for the successor. And now we're left with an entity that sold itself, took our freedom of contract, didn't seem to care much about it, and threw it out the window, only they want to impose the bad parts of the contract upon us to protect their successor. That's a protective self. That's a different situation. And the breach of a contract is not the same as termination. PowerPoint, which you guys put up in the slides we talked about, where other parts of the contract survive in the event of termination, is not the same as a breach. In order to, I guess in order to illustrate that argument, assume Company A is a lumberyard. And I work at a lumberyard and I have a 9 to 5. Company A can sell all of its assets, decide not to pay me, not to do anything else, breach the contract, and leave me with nothing. The court in the end of course say, and it's repeated in our briefs, that is a breach. A breached contract cannot be enforced by the party that breached it. Thank you. What else do we have to cover today? If Your Honor would like to endeavor into hearing arguments on the various motions to strike, we can do that. Should we wait until we have a ruling on this motion for summary judgment? Is there any effect? Your Honor, from my perspective, I'm prepared to stand on the briefs on this. All right. That's fine, Your Honor. All right. There are a couple of motions to strike that we did not get a response to the line standing briefs. Okay. And you would file a response to what they filed just today? Yes, that's correct. Yes, sir. Okay. That's fine, Your Honor. I do want to let the court know, and I don't want to be seen to push this. The size of that file is, you know, bigger than both of us. I just don't. I know that these doctors, as of June 30th, are in overtime. That's disconcerting. I don't know if the court can do that quickly or not. I don't know when they're done by June 30th. We're asking for as much efficiency as we can. The only delay that I have is I have a vacation plus schedule starting July 3rd. Okay. Thank you. Your Honor, all I'm asking is begging the court to put all possible. We will. All right. And this case, Agenda Number 5, Number 130447, Jensen v. Company A, will be taken under advisement. Thank you both for your arguments.
It really doesn't matter as long as they're within some reasonable time for each other. Fairly safe. Well, it's obviously one two floors below my We can exchange them amongst ourselves and determine the width of the disk. They would have it the same day. I don't know that it's fair for one party to see the other party's work. Is that all right? It's fine. All right. Then anything else? Nothing I can think of. All right, gentlemen. Thank you. Wait for your uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.